What's up? It's your boy Gary Baca right here with Funk Royalty. I got my man Jimmy Jam, James Harris III up in here. And man, I'm excited. I'm gonna try to keep my composure. But uh, of course we know James Harris, Jimmy Jam from the time, Prince produced that group. And then we already know about Sherelle, Alexander O'Neill. Uh, but let's go back, uh, Climax, and uh, uh, of course Janet, Mariah Carey, uh, so many people. Uh, Jimmy, it, man, welcome to Gary Baca TV on YouTube. You. And just, man, just thank you for talking with us. Absolutely. Yeah, man, so what are you working on? I know you're doing stuff all the time, man. What you up to? Well, the main thing is we just celebrated the first anniversary of Jam and Lewis Volume 1, which was our debut album. Uh, some of the people you mentioned are on the album. Uh, it's everybody from uh, Sounds of Blackness, Boys to Men, Mariah Carey, uh, Mary J. Blige, uh, just a lot of Charlie Wilson, just a lot of our great artists that we really enjoy working with. So we're having some fun with that. Uh, we have a Mary J. Blige record that's coming out uh, from the album, uh, but it's a remix that's coming out uh, here pretty quickly. And uh, we're just having a lot of fun. Now, the group The Secret, this is like a group that was a secret, yes. but uh, it, they, they were supposed to come out with something. Yeah. And uh, so is this kind of a, a, the secret coming out, you yeah. know, finally, and, and putting yeah. these artists together? Yeah, pretty much so. That was, uh, we started the project 35 years ago, and uh, what happened was we started working with Janet. And when we started working with Janet, then we pushed that project aside. But then Janet ended up taking one of the songs, which became What Have You Done For Me Lately. So when that became a hit, all of a sudden our production career was born and our artist career was on hold for about 35 years. So now we're, we're artists now, which is kind of fun for the first time. Yeah, and of course you work with SOS Band. You know, recently we uh, heard that Mary Davis had a stroke. And, yep. uh, so uh, what was it like working with the SOS Band in those great days, man? It know? was fantastic. SOS Band was so pivotal because the first thing it did is it introduced us to Clarence Abel. That's right. And Taboo Records. So that was the first thing it did. Um, the next thing that it did was it got us caught in a snowstorm in Atlanta uh, when we were recording those, those right. songs. And literally, got the, day that, yeah, the day that Prince fired us is the same day we mixed Just Be Good To Me. So it was kind of fate, you know, the way that it, that it all went down. But the thing was cool, and I hung with Abdul Rauf tonight for a little while. They were, SOS Band was so welcoming to us because we were just two young producers. We didn't really know what we were doing. And they could have been like, you know, well, what are y'all doing? And, but they just kind of trusted us. And he said it was like really special, his memory of the recording sessions and stuff. But uh, they were very welcoming to us. It was our, really our first time outside of LA trying to record stuff. And they were, they was great. It was a great experience, man. It's great to, the fact that they're still around, you know, Mary doesn't travel, but she's still singing. And she did a show with them in Nashville not that I long that. ago. Yeah, it was very good. So yeah. she's still up and still doing her thing. And so it's, it's all good. Speaking of those classic bands, um, you know, you I know you're working with, uh, you mentioned Janet, you're doing other new things. But uh, some of us old schoolers love Alexander O'Neill and yeah. Sherelle. And yeah. I know this question has come up before. Uh, do you think you'll ever go back and work? Because we love Alex, you know? And yeah, you we do too. Do something? We do too. Um, We'll see. Um, we actually just, uh, we're doing music for a TV show that's coming up next year. And one of the songs that we're actually working on in the show is actually an Alexander O'Neill Sherelle duet. So we'll see whether that, uh, we'll see what happens with that, but our intentions are to uh, to use it on, this, on the show, so. We know your production company is called Flight Time because it yeah. has a little feet and they, you're, you're all ready to go all the time. So <laughs> uh, I know, uh, you know, you got a role, but we got to ask you about uh, Prince, of course. Um, you know, we lost him, and we, I'm doing tributes every June 7th, you know, and I just did one recently with Jill Jones. We're on the air right sure. here on KPFK 90.7. Yep. Um, you know, uh, what did you learn from that, um, thinking back? Because I know years have passed. Uh, what was the best advice you got from Prince, or what did you learn most? The thing I learned most from Prince was work ethic. And the story I always tell about that is um, when we were rehearsing 777, Prince was at the rehearsal, and we ran the song, we thought it sounded good. He looked at me, he said, Jimmy Jam, what are you doing with your left hand? And I said, I'm not doing anything with my left hand. Prince, I'm just playing the bass line. He said, 
play the bass line with your left hand, play the chords with your right hand. And I said, well, Monty's playing the chords. He says, no, it's got to be bigger than the record. Said, okay, cool, so I'm playing. Then he goes, what note are you singing? I said, I'm not singing a note. And he said, find a note to sing. So now I'm playing and I'm singing. Seven, 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 93, 11. Then he goes, how come you're not doing the choreography? I said, Prince, I'm standing behind a keyboard. He said, it's simple, you should be able to do it. So now I'm trying to do it. Seven, 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 I'm trying to hit the choreography. And I can't do it, and I'm frustrated. And we keep doing it over and over and over and over. So the next day we come back to rehearsal, we walk in, Prince goes, seven, seven, seven. And I just kind of go, oh man. And about a minute into the song, I'm not even thinking about it. I'm hitting my note, I'm hitting my keys, and I'm hitting my steps. And I'm so, I'm doing it so easy, then I'm like tipping my hand, I'm taking my hanky out, I'm patting myself. It taught me work at it. You gotta, he believed more in what I was thinking I could do than I thought, right? And he would work six hours with our band, six hours with the Revolution, then he'd go to the studio all night and work. And there's a, you know, that saying about, you know, hard work beats talent, when talent doesn't work hard. So Prince was, he was the hard work and the talent but it was contagious to everybody else. So that to me is the best lesson in and, and And your production career, I noticed, man, that like songs like Control, 12-inch uh, version, Innocent, the long version, uh, I Didn't Mean to Turn You On, long version, uh, All Right, uh, these, you, you went into some deep Minneapolis funk. Oh, right? absolutely. In there. Oh, and yeah. so, you know, I used to always associate that kind of like with Prince at one point too. Like when you heard "Lady Cab Driver," oh, and yeah, when yeah. you heard, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, absolutely. How, how, how could you make that connection, man? Were you in? You know, were you no, we were all, hearing that? Yeah. Well, no, we were all influenced by the same things growing up in Minneapolis. We were hearing music from all over. It wasn't like just hearing East Coast or West Coast music. It was a whole lot of different stuff. And then also, the idea of fusing f uh, funk and rock together. Um, we grew up listening to pop radio because there really was no black station up there. There was one, but it was a sun up to sundown AM station at the top of the dial with no signal really, right? So we listened to pop radio. So we were listening to, you know, it was a hybrid of, you know, for me it was like Seals and Crofts in America and Chicago. Prince was listening to Fleetwood Mac and Santana and, um, you know what I'm saying? So it was it was always kind of a hybrid of what we were doing, but then Terry was the one that always said, but well, we needed to have two keyboard players because that's what's going to be. And then when synthesizers came, it was all kind of the same. We were all kind of on the same page about that stuff. But uh, Prince was definitely the pioneer of it, no question about it. I always associate the Minneapolis sound with Prince, but we all grew up in that same environment, man. So we had those same influences, and we didn't think there was anything wrong with throwing a rock guitar on a funky track, you know, so. Was uh, when you went into the studio? I think it was uh, what time is it? Album. He goes, Hey Jimmy, you guys have that conversation going. Um, was, was that something that was planned? Was that just something that you guys were just doing? Uh, you know. A lot of it was just kind of. Yeah, it was just kind of sporadic, you know, spontaneous. Yeah, it was all kind of spontaneous at that point. The way Prince, you know, we learned a lot from production on the Prince side of things because Prince was very spontaneous and it was very much you know, one take, two takes maybe, but just get it done, start it and finish it. And then we went from that to, when we came to LA, we started working with Leon Silvers III. Oh, yeah. And Leon Silvers III was the exact opposite, very meticulous and very exact and everything had to be like that. So we developed our style with kind of the looseness and spontaneity of Prince, but then for some things kind of the exactness of what Leon had. So we kind of learned from those two masters, I guess if you will. Man, Jimmy Jam, it's been great talking with you, now, man. You, I know man. you got to run. Hey, if you have any advice for musicians, people in the media, you are, let me tell you this, Jimmy Jam, uh, when the time came out, 1981, uh, I was deeply affected by you guys. Uh, Chicano Latinos were really, we really identified with your dress, what you said, how you talked, the zoot suit. And for a long time, we thought we were the time. I thought I was Morris. My uncle, we argued about who was Morris right. and who was Jerome. Right. Uh, and, and so, but the music that you produced uh, gave me an attitude about life how the way I live more than any other, I, I would say, man, that 
because, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of groups, man, and, you know, we could talk about the Isley Brothers, we could talk about Cameo, we could talk about Compunction, but something about um, my generation with, with the time with you guys, um, you know, uh, man, uh, it just deeply influenced us and, and made and it's a really big part of our lives, man. And Thank you. That you are a part of me. Thank you. Because uh, cause we, 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 we got that talk, you know, from Minneapolis, because we just so funky, ain't nobody better. You know, we got the hat, we got the, the glasses, man, and man, I always wanted to be like, like you, man. Uh, so anyway, give Thank it up you. one more time for Jimmy Jam, James Harris III from The Time. Still in The Time? Always. All right, Always. for life. Yep, time right? for life. We're waiting for that uh, next album. Yep, we are too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, peace. <laughs>